You're listening to the God Stories Radio Podcast with Fritz, Mike, and Tina, bringing hope, comfort, and encouragement through the power of the Christian testimony. Listen live on the Mixler app and follow us on your favorite platform, including iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Radio.com. Stay connected with us on Facebook and Twitter at God Stories Radio. Edition of God Stories Radio. This is session 251. I'm Fritz. I'm Mike. And I'm Tina. What's going on? It's Thursday, Thursday night. night. It's right Thursday here. night. Ah, under the lights. You know it. Wow. Woo, we made it. Yeah, really. But what's going on out there? We Tommy would argue with me, but this is the best place to be on a Thursday night. <laughs> Absolutely. Not to steal their thunder. Uh huh. <laughs> Those are my peeps. <laughs> Tommy's chatting. Hey, buddy. Good to see you. Uh, who else is on there? Lee Phillips? And we got somebody Hi, else. I can't tell who you are. If you follow us, I can tell. There's several people on right now. That's fantastic. We got a good crowd already. Yeah. Already. Don't forget to follow us on Mixler. That way Fritz can know who you are and shout out your name. And then also don't forget to like us on Facebook because we're getting low on likes here. I know. But we do have one this week. So we want to say thank you to Sister Letty. Sister Letty? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sister Letty. Welcome. Thank you for liking us on Facebook. Welcome to the GSR family. Yes. So happy to have you with us. Wow. What else is going on over there, Mikey? Well, I was trying to think of what uh, I could come up with today, but um, I went to get a haircut today. And (laughs) that's epic. It is. Um, the same lady that usually cuts your hair, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Jackie. Jackie. And she just opened up her new place called Curl Up and Die. Oh, cute. In the uh, center of uh, Claremont. And that's catchy. It is, huh? And uh, she says, you know, Mike, when she finished, she says, I've been cutting your hair for a while. And she says, I'm telling you right now, I know that your hair, some of it is growing back. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> says okay thank you (laughs) there you go mikey the blessings of the lord uh are abounding well Uh there's hope and encouragement for you there you go if you get nothing else uh, out of tonight uh god can regrow hair god can restore anything Uh (laughs) that he can there is no limit that is awesome. It was, it was awesome. She said, what did you change? I said, well, I have changed a few things and, in, in, you know, my eating and drinking pineapple juice and for the bromelain and stuff like that. And for the what? The bromelain? Yeah. It's, is that uh, soup? What is that? It's, it's got a, um, what do you call it, agent in it. It's bromelain. And I was actually taking it because I have gout. And I read that because I don't want to take the allopurinol anymore, the, the pill. So actually for the past maybe five, six months, I've been drinking organic pineapple juice and mm. having pineapple at least once a day, every day. And then come July 1st, I said, okay, it's time. And I have not taken a pill since July 1st. And wow. My, my, right now, my joints are still fine. Well, praise the Lord. That's awesome. And your hair's growing back. And it's going back. (laughs) What is going on? The comeback kid. And your truck's clean. I mean, Uh goodness gracious. No excessive tire wear or any kind of side effects or anything, you know? No. Wow. I'm just jealous he gets to have pineapple juice. Right? Yeah. It's expensive. Especially when you get the organic stuff. Yeah, we went keto, Mike. I know. I heard about it. Yeah. 
I'm sure you heard <laughs> you in a complaining manner hear about it. Because <laughs> <laughs> it won't be the COVID that'll kill me; it'll be the keto. <laughs> no carbs. Oh, well, it's probably like the no carb diet. Who was that? Uh, Atkins. Atkins diet. Yeah. I used to do that too, and well, it used to make fun co- of him too until well, he found out it worked. It, it, it did. <laughs> I did it a number of times, but about week two or week three, you are craving sweets like you never did before. And well, once you do, you can't stop. I'm day 21. Okay. Yeah. Just watch out for those sweets. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm proud of it because I didn't think I could last, but I'm holding out. So All right. I'm trying. Well, Got my I husband have, on the bandwagon now. Yeah, but I have some new incentive today because I went to the doctor. My LDL cholesterol, I'm not even going to discuss it. And I and the doctor looked at me. He said, it's probably not diet. It's uh, genetics. So I got to go see an endocrinologist, I think is what uh-huh. it's called. And I don't know. I know the father. I know the great physician. Uh-huh. I'm going to get him involved. What do you think? So your LDL is not good or it is not good? Good. Oh, the triglycerides. LDL's good, right? right? What are the bad ones? HDL. Yeah, something like that. Well, one or the other. I don't know which one is which. Okay, we'll leave that to the pros. Okay. <laughs> so the keto isn't helping out. No, we're he not, just started. We don't know yet. He just started because he has a hard time with carbohydrates. Oh, I'm a growing and boy. Sugars, Mister Pop Tart eating pretzel. <laughs> hey, <binging>. hey, hey. <laughs> I can't have those? Whoa. Not anymore. Oh, boy. (laughs) All right, enough. Yeah, I cut you off right there. I can do that because I'm the host. Yeah. (laughs) You're the producer. You can do it. All right. We got the likes. Any countries? Same at 109. 109 countries. Who to thunk it? Seven years, 251 episodes, and 109 countries. countries. Mm -hmm. Wow. God is good. He is. He is all the time. Considering he chose us because we have faces for radio. Right. And we're <laughs> we're still here after two. We are still here, even though we tried to quit. Mm-hmm. Just not on the same week. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. Enough babbling. You got anything else, babe? No, no, no. I just, uh, I do want to thank all the people who have donated and contributed to GSR over the years. Uh, we wouldn't be here without your generous support. So Amen thank you. That. We really appreciate you. We love you. We and for those people who have just prayed for us, my goodness, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank really. you. Because, you know, we need it. We really do. Yeah, prayer prayer works. Prayer works. And it really helps. So thank you so much for all that I you I love guys it when do. the Brit comes out in you, though. Contribute. <laughs> oh, stop. <laughs> Contribute. Uh-huh. All right. I love it. And speaking of prayer, I just want to mention it again. All this going on out there, the Father is trying to get everybody's attention he is and i just we need to pray for the country we need to pray for our leaders pray for yourself too yes we need to all be praying and Absolutely. getting closer to the I lord mean, we all need to time. be bathed in prayer mm-hmm. and it's always good to know that people are praying for you mm-hmm. it really is a lot of power in that mm-hmm it is, yeah, definitely a lot. Ray, of power. Ray, all day. I see you, buddy, and uh, his lovely wife, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Is on Hi, tonight. Ray. Welcome, welcome to welcome. the show. You guys dialed into a good one, and if you haven't had a chance to check out the Battle Podcast, Ray and uh, John Durham, the Battle Podcast. If you're a man and you're looking for a the good right podcast. way, a good podcast, yeah. check it out. The Battle Podcast. Those guys are so on point and they just are amazing men of Christ. I mean, they're just wonderful, wonderful human beings. They walk the walk. They really do. No doubt about it. Yeah. Speaking of wonderful human beings, we have one in the studio tonight. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And uh, this is uh, Everett Kaufman and he is business partner and best friend to uh, Tommy Moore, who is uh, just... I. I can't say enough about Tommy, uh, what he does. And in fact, Tommy just got his PhD. Congratulations, Tommy. He's Dr. Tommy, Tommy right now. And he gave his testimony not too long ago. I, it wasn't I too long ago. I can't remember. I don't either. remember what the number was. I'll look but. for that while you guys chat. Okay. 
But uh, Everett was referred to us from Tommy and has a similar testimony. And I've been reeling for a week to hear this testimony. Uh And I'm just going to shut my mouth at this point and introduce to you. What's the number, babe? 222. Oh, 222 would be Tommy Moore's testimony. So you can go back in the archives or on the website and listen to 222. That's Tommy Moore. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the show, Mr. Everett Kaufman. Welcome, Everett. Welcome, Everett. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. Yeah. Nice uh, to have you. <laughs> it's the least we can do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, Mike is yours. All right. Well, first of all, it's just an it's just an honor to be here to be able to talk about God and just how good God is and just the incredible story that can happen to anybody's life. And I'm just another another uh, instrument where God can can use anybody, right? So I guess I'll tell you a little bit about my life. Um, so I'm native to Central Florida. I grew up in Bay Lake. I don't know if you were the, know where that's from, but I'm a country boy. Okay. <laughs> you know, All right. I'm one of those kids from Red mascot Next in United. the back Red of the Next woods United. that kind of got picked on <laughs> when he was young from from growing up out there in uh-huh. the woods. You know, so I always tell people I'm a little slow, even though I may be intelligent. I'm a little slow, <laughs> but um, so I grew up out there. You know, um, at an early age, uh, I had some little interesting things. I went to school in mascot and um, I tested high. So they sent me to gifted school. I went into Claremont and that was the first time I started feeling like out of place. You know, I don't know if you still know the differences between Groveland and Claremont, but there's like, there's it's this not thing. A, it's not a shorter bus. Though, this, is, I did ride the short oh, bus. That's, it. that's the whole point of it. Yeah. But for the other reason. <laughs> and, um, you know, as a young person, it was really difficult for me to adjust just to the climate of the differences of, um, from that. And from an early age, like it was already, you were, I was already getting picked on for being it smart. It was like one of those things that was just really mm-hmm. odd that you're in that class, like you're different than everybody else. Right. And it didn't help. I started getting into sports and I had Groveland jerseys on and I'm in a Claremont school. So that wasn't good. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and life seemed pretty normal, man. My grandfather is a, he's a wonderful man. He's a true Renaissance man. He can do anything. He can take care of anything, can fix anything. And it was his legacy to build property for his family. So, so they had my dad and my uncle and my grandfather built this property out there. So I was kind of privileged in the sense that I, I was raised with all my family. Wow. Awesome. So, mm-hmm. so we had a tight knit community, my uncle and my aunt, and they had two kids, um, my cousins, who's my age, Ginger, and then me and my sister, my parents had us and we all had three houses right next to each other. So we grew up and up until the time I was probably 12 years old, you would have thought everything was just like a normal family, you know affair. There were times that I knew something may be off with my dad. My dad was a big guy. My dad was 6'3", probably 300 pounds. Mm, wow. That's you know? a big dude. <laughs> he was yeah. a big dude. You wouldn't want to sass off to him. No, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> and, you know, like every young man, you know, I I wanted to be like my dad. There was something about him. Mm. He was, I was telling you all earlier about scuba diving and he loved Jack Cousteau and he was all into always diving and things. And And my dad was always, he was around then, but up until that point, something took over my dad. My dad had always struggled with um, drug abuse and addiction that I I wasn't aware of, you know, Mm -hmm. I was a little kid. I didn't really know. But at that point, you could start to tell that things, something was wrong. Something was off. You know, I played sports. I always did very well in school. And at that point, my dad started to kind of slowly slip away out of my life. Right. Probably by the time I was 12, my dad never came to another baseball game, anything like that. And uh, it became to take a big toll on me. (laughs) And I think I didn't realize how much emotional um, pain I was in. Right. I really didn't know what was going on, but I started to find relief early on. Um, I'll never forget the first time I drank alcohol. I was probably 15 years old. And my dad said, I'll get you the alcohol, but you're going to drink what I drink. And he drank Ice House. I don't know if you ever drank beer, if you like beer, but Ice House is not a good beer. <laughs> <laughs> I love beer. But, uh, <laughs> keto and all. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's keto friendly beer now. <laughs> Do tell. Oh, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> Another story. <laughs> and um, I'll never forget it. The first time that I had consumed that alcohol, something inside of me was just lit up. Like I felt free, felt very free for the first time. And I didn't even know I was kind of caged up. And I told my buddies, I'm like, I can't believe you didn't tell me how great this stuff makes you feel. Right. <laughs> and, and um, my family, my uncle, my dad, they just liked to party. I mean, I was around it all the time. And at that point, um, I got to realize that my family was in deeper than drugs than I thought, right? Mm-hmm. So they um, were into methamphetamines and things like that. So by the time I was 15 years old, I was smoking methamphetamine, Ooh. 
you know, distributing out to my friends and thought it was just this cool thing, right? I was a kid that like could get could get all these things. And it was this interesting thing in your mind because you know at some level something's not right, but at the same time, like these are the people I'm close to. Like I, I was very connected to my uncle and my dad and, and I still love them very much. Um, but it just took a toll on me. Right. I mean, through high school, then I was still doing well in school. I don't know. Praise God. Somehow I still was able to keep a good straight A average. Um, but I'll never forget as I got older, my, my baseball coaches started to notice things were going on and I'll never forget. Um, when Mike Boyack, one of my friends that I grew up with, his dad, he looked over at me and he told me, he said, you know, he said, if you can't let us intercede and help you, then we're no longer going to be able to support your baseball career. Wow. And he says, yeah, it was a hard, it was a hard moment. Right. And um, I said, I don't want you to go talk to my family and get involved. And he said, you have straight A's, like you're going to get a scholarship. And that was the day that my baseball dreams went away. You know, Oh, how sad. Yeah, it was. It was sad. Ouch looking back it it was just this moment where you realize there were people that were there god cuz this is a christian man that were being placed in my life saying like we see you and we know something's going on but we don't know what to do and pretty much good luck like we wish the best for you and um so at that point that was the first time i got arrested i got arrested 5 days before i graduated high school mm. I had wow. ojt <laughs> I was leaving school and my mom had seen alcohol in my backseat of the car that morning. And she said, you need to, you know, if she's doing her thing, <laughs> yelling at me, what are you doing? Why is this? I'm like, whatever, I'll deal with it tomorrow. Well, that wasn't the case. When I left school that day, I had OJT, I had a card and everything. But when I got pulled over, the cop kind of knew who my family was at that point. I was kind of harassed a little bit here and there, pulled over. My dad would use my car, his friends. And they said, we smell marijuana in the car. Well, I hadn't been smoking marijuana, but they searched the car and they found uh, paraphernalia and they saw the alcohol. And he said, I'm calling the the chief in or whatever. And the chief said, no, take him to jail. Oh, gosh. And that was wow. one of the, at that point, the worst day in my life because my mother always said, don't ever call me from jail. She knew what was going on. I She knew more than what I thought she knew at that point. Because at 18, you know everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's true. And that day, tell me I got a 17 year old (laughs) that day, you know, um, I had to call her and it broke my heart to call her. And that should have been my first indication when I was in drug court, then that I had an issue, right? Because I made her purchase, you know, uh, cleansers for me and everything. I couldn't stay clean. And at that point, all the drug court people there in this little community, they're like, Oh, you're a straight A student. You're going I had a full ride to USF. I won a presidential award. Um, and they're like, just trying to get me out of it. You know, they're mm-hmm. like, oh, you just got caught with a little pot. No big deal. But I couldn't stay sober then. I couldn't mm-hmm. even quit then. You were already addicted. I was already in the mindset like I need this stuff, mm-hmm. right? So to kind of fast forward it, you know, I the, we could talk, I could talk a lot about all those things that were going on, but it was bad. You know, my... Uh, it was really bad because I wanted to be close to my dad. And the only way I could ever be close to him is if I was using. Mm. And the people that were around and surrounding us with the methamphetamine, um, it was just a, it's an interesting world that these people live in and the world that I lived in. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's hard to describe, but all I will say is there is a spiritual darkness around that drug Mm -hmm. and what it does to people. Mm. Tell us a little about what it does do to people. I really feel like it just, it kind of invades the soul, but people stay up for so long. They start to almost hallucinate and they're very paranoid. Um, They think everybody's out to get them. Uh, They pick at their face and their arms and it just really destroys people. And most people, it's it's a highly addictive drug, right? Mm -hmm. You can use it every time and you continue to get high on it. It's not like something you can just not get high. Every time you use more and more and more, you're going to stay up longer and longer and longer, right? I mean, there'd be periods of time where we'd stay up three, four, five, six days. Oh. And how could, wow. that, how could that even be? Okay. I mean, I don't know. I've never done any of that stuff before. How could that, you know, with what you said, the, the stuff, the side effects, let's say, how could that even be, I want to do this again? That's, that's the whole insanity of drug addiction, Wow. Mm-hmm. right? And I tell people that all the time now today in mm-hmm. the work that I do. But, um, but my dad, they got into manufacturing methamphetamine, right? Um, so I was a part of these drug circles and rings and things that were just very interesting. That's all I'll say. It was just, 
it's this world that you never thought you'll be a part of. But at the same time, it's like, I'm a part of it. Like right then you're thinking like year of 2000, like I was into um, just all this different rap music and my car, you know, my car and just wanting to be popular and all these different things. And it was just, it just fit in. Right. I had, I had females, I had some money, I had the drugs, we had X, you know, things we were just having fun. It was all about having fun and feeling good. That's all it was about. Mm. So I left for college and I did a lot of the same things by the grace of God. I don't know how I barely remember much of my undergrad at USF. I mean, it was same things, just partying, hanging out, doing all that kind of stuff. And I'll never forget um, this feeling inside was, this, was the, the, one of the other big moments is after I graduated, people started to look at me and they asked me, what are you going to do with your life? And I felt like for the first time in my life, I had no idea how to answer that. I had just been skating by doing my thing and mm -hmm. not knowing where I was going. And I felt very lost inside. <laughs> and I started working for Marriott at that time. I was probably 21 and I loved it there. You know, I worked hard, partied a lot, did all that kind of stuff. And I'll skip up for a few years. And I somehow, when I graduated in 2007, I met my wife, who is my wife now, Tasha. And um, I what was dating- What a cool name. Tasha. Yeah. She's from Germany. She's beautiful. And um, and I'll never forget, I was, I was actually dating this other girl when I met her. And then I just confessed my love to her. And I know she thought I was crazy. She still thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> but- but that started um, this whole new chain of events, right? I, her and I got together and I'll be honest, I may have been a really good friend to people, but I wasn't a good boyfriend. I didn't know how to stay faithful. I didn't know how to treat a woman. I didn't know how to respect myself so much less. I didn't know how to respect mm -hmm. somebody else. And I'll never forget when uh, we were on and off again and she got pregnant with my son in 2008. And it was right after this moment where we had said, like, we're not going to talk anymore. We're not going to talk anymore. And I'll never forget, you know, I would tell her like, you just need to, you have to get rid of the, the baby. Like we're, we, we don't like each other. We don't want to be together. And thank God, by the grace of God, she just wasn't having that. And the interesting thing is she wasn't really a believer at that point. It was actually during her pregnancy with our son that she actually came to believe that something, something had changed inside of her. And, um, so going through my relationship with her was just a really difficult time. Um, I didn't know how to stay sober. I didn't know how to treat her. And through a series of events, I was arrested in 2000. And let's see. Well, let me go back for a moment. There's an interesting component because what brought me down to my knees is I started taking Oxycontin. Mm. I got heavy into Oxycontin, right? It started with Percocet. Then it went to Roxy, Roxycontin. And I mean, we were eating them for, taking them for years. We were, once again, I got into these rings where... People were selling scripts, getting scripts, fake MRIs. I mean, just this big ring of just craziness. And it led me down into a horrible place where I became severely addicted, severely addicted. And, um, and somehow I went to treatment in 2012 and I'll never forget. <laughs> it was like the, the worst $50,000 insurance could ever pay for. I go down there and they tell me like, my dad's my problem, my girlfriend's my problem. And that's what I got out of it. I didn't know. I knew that I couldn't keep using heroin, oxy, cocaine. Those were my favorite drugs. So I came home and immediately relapsed. And in 2013, this is the craziest part about this is I was running home at hundred miles an hour from Tampa on 75 and I got pulled over by um, the FDLE and the guy was like, it took me seven miles to catch you. Mm. Right. Oh. And he, as soon as he opens the window, he looks down in the car and there's three grams of cocaine sitting in my seat. Oh. And he points the light right at it. I didn't know that it was there. I mean, I obviously knew that I had to open the car and stuff. And he just, and he's like, that's not what I think it is, is it? And I knew that was the first time in my life I knew I was in deep trouble. Wow deep trouble. Right. And I'll never forget. Once again, my mom came, came to my mind and I had all this NA literature and, you know, a recovery stuff in the back of my car because I had been to treatment kind of trying to see if I could get sober. And I said, just let me call my mom. And 
I convinced him, which was the truth that I had severe issues because he was going to write me up for distribution. He found so many baggies and things in my car. And somehow I've never been able to contact this man, but he scratched out all of that and charged me with possession. And once again, through the grace of God, I was, um, I was put into drug court in Pasco County. A drug court's a wonderful thing. I know people um, don't really understand a lot of these programs that we have. And, but drug court is a program for people for first time offenders, felony offenders. So I got hit with a felony charge. <clears throat> they suspended me from work. Um, all the repercussions started coming down. But the worst part again is once I realized is I couldn't stop using the people like me in, in my little treatment center, they said, okay, <laughs> I was in court and they said, sign this thing for nine months. You stay sober for nine months and all this goes away. So back up the film just a second. This yeah. was just a random officer. Random officer. That you didn't know, didn't had know. no relationship with, that yeah. just scratched it out. Yeah. Wow. Random. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that was when God's first hand came into play. So I couldn't, so I couldn't stay sober. I'm struggling. Me and I had left Tasha and my son's name is Wesley. I told them like, you're better off without me. I told her parents what we were into. I said, her dad's a military officer in the military. I said, listen, you, this is what's going on. I'm not, this isn't good. Like you have to protect her and keep her away. Cause I pulled her into the darkness and I didn't want my son to turn out like me. I just couldn't, the cycle was perpetuating. Mm-hmm. And I just said, I really felt in my heart, they were better off without me. Mm. And um, it hurts just to say that. I bet. Right I now. can hear it I can, in yeah, your I voice. I can hear it in your voice. Yep. And, um, but I truly felt that I believed that because I didn't think I could get out of it. So you have this felony charge now and you've yeah. lost your job as a result. I didn't. So the interesting thing was I got suspended. Oh, wow. <laughs> I got suspended. Right. And um, that was the first time. And then they brought me back on. They allowed me to come back to work. So I couldn't, I kind of want to get through this. So I couldn't, I couldn't um, stay sober and they violated me. They violated me. I had a story. Oh, this is the reason. Then they violated me again. And finally, Judge Crane down there, I love this guy. He's a great man. He, he finally said, lock him up. So they locked me up and I'm in jail with all these people, these drug offenders, different things. And, and uh, they're like, you're going to get back out. They'll let you out. They're just showing you something. Well, for five weeks straight, no six or seven weeks straight, they brought me in and out of court and I kept waiting for them to release me. And finally, this man, his name is Billy Majors, came into play and he came up to me and he said, listen, the counselors at Westcare, they've told me about you. They said, you're a good guy. Like they're going to score you out to go to prison, right? Like we can get you in a center. I can get you somewhere for six months. And like, they told me that like, you deserve this. Like we, I'm not trying to help. I'm trying to help you right now. Like, don't go to prison. Like, don't do this. And he was a Christian. I didn't know. I didn't know he was a Christian man. So I ended up going to this place called Ace Opportunities in Newport Ritchie. And that's where it saved my life. I went, um, I'll never forget this. These men came in for an AA meeting and I'm in this halfway house. And now <laughs> you can't, you got to remember this. This is the second time I've lived in a home with 20 men and five boys, five men or boys in a bedroom. Right. And that's wow. not the way I really want to live. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's five of us in this bedroom living once again. And I'm looking up and I'm crying at night. I'm going like, God, I, if you're like, I can't live like this. I, this can't be what life is coming to. And these men came in for this AA meeting and I'll never forget. I'm looking over. I'd made friends with a couple guys and these guys related. They were super excited. And they're like, yeah, God's real. And 12 steps, like you got to do it, you know, da, 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 da. And I'm like, what are these guys high on? Like <laughs> these, these, these guys are not sober. Like, Jesus. Yeah. These guys are not sober. This is, I've never seen this before. Right. And you have to imagine, I've never met anybody in recovery, like full recovery that have recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. I've never seen this before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And my, my buddy, Bobby, who prays God is sober again. Now he told me, he's like, Everett, they've done the work. Like these people have really like, they found freedom. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I got to try. I got to try. So I got a sponsor. His name was Roger. And I'll never forget. I, I went through my inventory with him and I cried and I choked as I released everything that I'd been holding on to for so long and all the pain and the shame. And I looked at him and he, and I just asked him, I'm like, am I going to die? Because I felt like I was going to die. <clears throat> wow. You did. Yeah. The uh, man right. died. Yep. Sure did. And he told me, he said, I want you to go home tonight and I want you to pray 
for an hour or two on your knees, I want you to pray that God fills this. Mm -hmm. Just pray, just tell him how much you really need him, Mm -hmm. right? And uh, I went home and (laughs) I'll never forget, I told the guys that I was staying in these five guys in this room, you know, I said, I need you to leave me alone. I'm going to get in here. I'm going to pray and, you know, the chuckles and the laughing and, oh yeah. And I got in and I sat down on my knees and I cried. I cried to God. I cried. And um, the next morning I woke up and there was, he was there. Like there was a fire inside of me. Like I knew it, like he touched me. Like Mm -hmm. it was, Ah. it was instantaneous. Mm -hmm. That's the Holy Spirit. And I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that God was real. Like he was real. So they start testing me. I'm in drug court. I'm in, I'm in this program. I'm in counseling. And they're like, Everett, like you're a smart guy. Like you're telling us God's healed you. And I'm like, yes, he's real. God's real. Like I'm flipping out. You got to imagine I'm, I'm like, look like a crazy person. (laughs) I'm running around. I got a Bible. I'm telling them about the steps. Like I'm just on fire. I'd never felt this before. Mm -hmm. And of course I, I wasn't, I, I'd been raised a Christian, but I wasn't really active. And I said, I want to go to the church. And I'll never forget, I love Jesus culture. And I went to this church, Calvary Chapel in West, in, um, in Newport Ritchie. Newport Ritchie, yeah. And they played the song, Just Dance. There were certain songs they played. And it was the first time ever that like, I, I remember lifting my hands up and I could feel the song. What is it? Walking in the clouds and things like that. But anyways, it just elated me. And I, and I chased it. I chased it. And I never stopped. And they told me, like, people told me, like, don't worry about Tasha. You know, she's not going to forgive you. Like, people get hyped up all the time and think God's going to just change everything. Your problems aren't just going to go away. And one by one, God restored my relationship with her. Mm -hmm. Came to the Methodist church, got active in Celebrate Recovery. Was able to take her to Germany to see her family where she grew up and proposed to her and, and bought her a beautiful ring on her, on her grandparents, her mom and Opa's 50th wedding anniversary oh, in a castle. Oh, wow. wow. I didn't even know. Does it get any better I didn't than even that? know, right? You proposed in Germany? <laughs> in Germany oh. at a castle. So try and beat that. No. All right. <laughs> it was a big deal, but I didn't I know. I appreciate that. I'm a crowd. I didn't know that it was their 50th anniversary, right? That's really cool. And, um... So then I had to figure out what I was going to do. Everybody always said, oh, you should be a counselor. You should be a counselor as I was, you know, even almost helping run the groups after I got ignited. Mm -hmm. And I kept hearing about Southeastern University on the radio, Southeastern University. So I'm like, I got to go. And that's where I met Dr. Manley. Dr. Manley is a great mentor and brother and friend of mine. And he's from Groveland. And he met me. He's like, you're from Groveland. He's like, (laughs) I got to talk to you. And I told them my story. I just told them kind of similar to what I've told you tonight. And uh, they said, we want you here. We want you here. We'll accept you. Because I didn't tell you my GPA at that point was a 2.7 from undergrad. Coming from being a straight A student Mm -hmm. my whole life. And they said, we'll accept you on academic probation. I said, that's great. What do I got to do? They're like, you got to go to a writing center every week. You got to show them your work and get tutored and all this stuff. I said, I'll do whatever it takes. So I walked through that program. And to say I had a, had a, a straight A average through graduate school. And um, got to go work and start counseling and things like that. And and um, during that time, I told Pastor Doug we want to get married. And Pastor Don said, "Come in the church. Like, let's just let's just do it." So as soon as we got engaged, I came home. We got married, and um, you know, God's just been able to minister uh, through me, through people, and teaching at Celebrate Recovery. And Celebrate Recovery was just a pivotal place for us where I could bring my family and we could all find healing together. Mm-hmm. Yep, you're in good company here. You know, it was yeah. it was a wonderful place, you know, and I was able, that's where God first asked me to get up and start speaking and teaching, right? So I used to give my testimony and I would speak at AA and stuff. And I told Tommy, I said, I think God wants me to. And I was terrified. I was <laughs> like, I don't want to. <laughs> and that's how God speaks to me. He always asks me to do things. That's why I know it's God's voice because I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't want to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> don't, don't. That's the way I, that's the way I uh, look at it too. <laughs> don't push me there. I'm not ready. Yeah. So I got up and start doing that, right? And um, next thing you know, um, I was decided I was going to go to doc school. And I have to share this point of it was at that point, even with all the healing, I still didn't believe as much in myself as I, you would hope, right? And uh, I went to Dr. Manley's office. I'll never forget. And I said, well, I talked to Capella because I got denied from a few schools already and I was heartbroken, you know? And I said, they're going to take me in and I think they're going to let me teach online and, you know, this and that. And he looked me dead in the eye. Like I'm super excited. And he said, is that your dream? You want to go to Capella? <laughs> 
<laughs> and I started crying. Tears came down my <laughs> wow. eye, right? So he's a gator. I've been a gator, a, a, a Groveland gator and a Florida gator my whole life. And I said, you know, that's not my dream. My dream is to go to the University of Florida. He said, isn't your dream worth fighting for? Wow. And I'll never forget sitting there and just crying. And I said, yeah, yeah, I think it is. I think I'm going to fight. And he says, you have so much more inside of you than what you know. Mm -hmm. And so I applied, I restudied for my GREs, scored very high, went and interviewed, told them a little bit about myself. And next thing you know, within another month, I received a full offer, a full scholarship wow. to the counseling program to get my PhD at the University of Florida. Wow. <laughs> That's, That's so how father amazing. rolls. It is, it is. Wow. And, and, and we know that uh, when he takes you through something, right? Usually, it's what he's going to use you to do to bring other people through. All the little coincidences mm -hmm. that lined up, you know, all these people that came into his life, you know, starting with the officer and then the, the other guy. Mm -hmm. and then yeah. It's just that we happen to be a Christian from Groveland and this yeah. and that. You pick up on those little things and that's all the little pieces and that here's God puts together. The, the greatest thing about it, too, now at the university, right? So I was offered a teaching position. And what did I teach? Alcohol and substance abuse. In undergrad, oh my gosh. Right? So then after a few years, now I helped uh, to write and we received a federally funded grant to work on training counselors in substance abuse. So I've just been a part of the team and we've designed curriculum and instruction to help new counselors get more education and mm -hmm. training on how to perform interventions and um, just motivate clients to change. It's fantastic. So... You know, it all kind of came back around and um, I had my first journal article published recently um, and uh, God just continued to, to bless me in that avenue, you know, and somebody like me who came from the depths of <laughs> addiction, you know, and I told you a little bit about it, but, you know, at that point when they pulled me out of jail, I was considered homeless, right? Mm -hmm. You and had nothing. I you had were nothing. stripped down. Yeah, I guess you really didn't. I the was the, the first day. time I was riding a bicycle around public transportation. And that mm -hmm. was one of the most freest times in my life. And that's what I was thinking about the other day. When God first came into my life, I started giving everything away. And people were like, ever, you stop giving people stuff. And I'm like, I don't need it anymore. <laughs> I don't need anything. Like I yeah. have what I've been looking for. I have what I've been looking for. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of my motivation to people now is no matter where you've been, no matter, no matter what you've been through. God's got a place for you, right? There's something inside of us all that we just need to get excavated, right? And what it took for me was just to have people that believed in me, mm -hmm. right? And I still, at this point now, finally believe that I can see what other people did. Right? I think your mama always believed in you, though. She did. Yeah. You know it. Mm -hmm. You know those praying mamas and grandmamas? Oh, yeah. 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 I think we've all had one. Yeah. Woo. So, you know, now that's where we're at. You know, I'm at the university. We, uh, Tommy and I opened up Priority One Coaching, Counseling and Consulting. We've been, we were able to, this was another great thing. Our family helped support us open it. We were able to pay back thousands of dollars that our family helped us to invest in us, mm -hmm. you know, and um, now we're just deciding where are we going? You know, where's God taking this? How big is this going to get? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so... That's kind of a summation of it all. I'm excited for your future because now the books, the the new chapter in your book is all the lives that you're going to pour into and help. Mm -hmm. You're going to be become part of the restoration story for other people. So that's really cool. Yeah. That's been the greatest journey of like being a teacher and an educator now is that I'm able to pour into new counselors, right? And talk about love and attachment and connection and just building these intimate bonds and how we're, that's what we're here for. We're here for love mm -hmm. and connection and we need that from each other. And when we don't get it, we feel isolated and lonely and depressed, right? And, and we're in a world of <laughs> all kinds of wireless connection, mm -hmm. but not relational connection, right? Mm -hmm. right? And uh, living a lifestyle of isolation and distancing and it's uh, everything <laughs> contradictory to what we, what we need. Yeah. So good point. Wow. So tell us if you can, um, is your dad in your life at all anymore? So no. So my dad, so the cool thing about that, another kind of God, it was a God story too, is that my dad got out of prison. Actually, this is crazy. 
when I was in when I was in felony probation, I had Judge Crane wrote me a letter and signed for me to go into prison because felons are not allowed to go into prison. But he signed an affidavit and allowed me to go into the prison. And they they couldn't believe it when I got there. They're like, you can't come in here. And I had this thing that said I could made amends to my father, told him, I said, I forgive you. Like what happened and all this stuff, like it was hard for me, but I became a man and I started making choices on my own and, and I love you and I forgive you. And that was a great day. So fast forward when he got out was the first time in my life my dad was sober minded. He mm-hmm. stayed at home for a few years with my grandparents. He was severely depressed, but my dad was there. When I called him for the first time in my life, my dad was there. When my wife got a flat tire, I called him and he was there. When we went on vacation, he came with us. Wow. And um, sadly, he had an aortic aneurysm. I was telling you all okay, earlier, yeah. he had obviously had, you know, had abused his body for a long time and it had caused a lot of complications and he went in for surgery and didn't make it. But the greatest thing about that was they were all telling me, you need to go talk to your, I was in a training in Atlanta when this happened and they told me, you need to, you got to go talk to him. You got to tell him whatever. I said, I've already told my dad everything. And that's my encouragement. Even when I, when I spoke at his little service at our home, I said, life is too short. Like you have to tell the people that you care about, yep, say what you need to say, how much you love them and how much you value them. And the, <laughs> the other cool part of that too, which happened today was my father-in-law and my, and my mother-in-law have been a big support system for me. My mother-in-law has been a cheerleader for me this whole time. And um, my father-in-law, I'll never forget when I made amends to him six years ago. Like I said, he's a very stern military kind of guy. Mm-hmm. And he said, I'll, I don't believe that you're going to do much of this and that, you mm-hmm. know? And today I went and talked to him and I, and I didn't have the courage on Father's Day to tell him how I really thought, felt about him. And I went over today and I told him, I said, you know, I need you to know that you're really important to me and everything that you do for me and our family. Like I haven't, I haven't really experienced that and you showing up for me the way that you do. You know, I just need you to know how much I care for you and how much we appreciate what you do. And uh, he just looked, he kind of looked at me and I could see he was receiving it. And the funny thing was when I told him we needed to talk, he thought I was coming. He thought something was wrong. <laughs> uh huh. Like, oh, what's, sure. what's going on? Yeah. But, you know, he, uh, the greatest thing that I found in my recovery is being able to tell people exactly how I feel and and try to continue to promote that connection with people you know, because we don't, we're not promised tomorrow and we nope, only have each other, all. you know, we really do. And, um, so that's, that's like my goal as an educator and a counselor is really to help people get connected to healthy people, to save people and to build different attachment figures. You know, I, that's why I love celebrate recovery in the church. You know, I tell them, you know, you may not have your mom anymore. You may not have your brother anymore, but you have a new, you can, you can rebuild that system, right? We're all brothers and sisters, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Amen to that. And we can really take that in and it can help us to find healing. And that's my goal and what I write about. And when I get out and I speak, that's a big part of my research agenda. So when's the book coming out? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, What an amazing story you have. I know. Absolutely. I I knew it would not disappoint. Mm -hmm. I got bits and pieces from Tommy. So I was just enough to make (laughs) me salivate. You You know, it's like, Uh, ah, I can't wait. And uh, Everett was so quick to say yes. You know, he couldn't come that Thursday night, but he said, yep, I'll be there next week. I'm like, wow. I'm so glad you did. And I'm really so glad that you got the opportunity to share your story. And, you know, the really cool thing about God Stories Radio is that it just lives on. Your story lives on. Mm -hmm. You know, people around the world will listen to it. I mean, you know, let's hope that we're here for another seven years plus that, you know, seven years from now, somebody can listen to it. It's it continues to live and it continues mm-hmm. to inspire and encourage oh, and will. bring hope and um, do the very thing that God set in mind for it to do, mm-hmm. you know. So um, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yes. Thank you thank so you. much. Ever. We sure appreciate it. Hey, if you'd like to be a guest on God Stories Radio and you'd like to be in the studio with us, you sure can. Drop us a line at God Stories Radio Tina at gmail.com and she can get you scheduled. If you're not really the in person type and uh, would rather just write it down and send it in, you can do that too. God Stories Radio at gmail.com. And what else can they do, Mikey? They can tweet us. They can tweet us on the Twitter. And also <laughs> those little God Stories. 
Yes. That's what we are. God Stories Radio. That's, uh, that's right. And we've had a few that we've read that are unbelievable. Yep. We sure have. So uh, God Stories Radio at gmail.com. If you have prayer requests, drop them in there. And if you'd like to be a guest, God Stories Radio Tina at gmail.com. You know, give us a like and a thumbs up on Facebook, uh, everything GSR there. And we'll welcome you to the family. And be sure to follow us on Mixler so that you get notified when we're live each and every time. And man, what a great crowd tonight on Mixler. Uh, just um, Lee Phillips, Ray Ray all day. Sarah Flannery, Robert Herman, good to see you, brother. Good to see you. And there's Sarah. about five or six other people. I don't know who you are. If you follow us, I can see who you are. But welcome. You dialed into a good one tonight. We were so happy to have you. And like Tina said, thank you so much for the prayers and the support and uh, helping us to keep going through this weird time that we're facing with COVID crises and mm-hmm. social distancing and everything else that's going on in the world. Well, hopefully for... 45 minutes to an hour on Thursday night, we can bring you some comedic relief and, and mm-hmm. some hope and some comfort. It's been our only agenda since we got started. Absolutely. We never thought we'd be seven years and 251 episodes, but God is good. Yes, he is. All the time. Amen. Thank you again, Everett, for coming. Yeah. And uh, Thank you. Thank we you. really, really appreciate it. Thanks for everybody on Mixler and uh, everybody that just listens and prays for us. So that about wraps it up for session 251. I'm Fritz. I'm Mike. And I'm Tina. God bless. God bless. God bless. God bless.